And I can already hear you thinking, uh, you know a lot about fetal measurements. That's good. In fact, if at the end of this lecture you say to yourself, I knew every word of that lecture, and in addition, I could have given that lecture a lot better than Dr. Philly, I will be a happy person. What I would like to accomplish in large part today is to teach you the rules of measurement of each of these fetus, fetal parameters, and more importantly, to convince you to adhere to them. So rule number one is we need to avoid the temptation to make measurements fit the expected menstrual age. And you are left with the responsibility to do two things. You choose the plane of section on which the measurement will be made. And you choose where to position the calipers at the end points of measurement. And that's it. We'll start with the femur length. Uh, we'll start with the femur length because, in my opinion, it is the easiest of the measurements. Why is that? because I think of it as a unidimensional measurement. Basically, once you line up on the long axis of the femur, that is the only plane that is important to line up along the long axis of the femur. Once you have lined up along the long axis of the femur, then you could potentially rotate the transducer through a 360 degree arc along that line and you would obtain exactly the same measurement in each increment of that 360 degree rotation. Absolutely nothing about the measurement would change, which means that an infinite number of planes of section are available to give us the measurement that we want. Again, with the femur, we are measuring a bone, so the end points of measurement are good. And therefore, the number of pitfalls in this measurement are small. So, the best way to describe what we are measuring throughout gestation is to say, we are measuring the greatest longitudinal dimension of the primary ossification center of the femur. So let's look at the biparietal diameter as a measurement. Again, this is a relatively easy measurement. I think of this as a two-dimensional measurement. You must get the right height on the skull, and the beam cannot be inclined. So you must get the right level, and the beam must not be inclined. So you have to be correct in two dimensions. However, once the beam intersects those two points on the fetal calvaria, then you could rotate the transducer through a 360 degree arc that intersects those two points, and you would get exactly the same measurement uh, as you did in any of the other planes through that 360 degree arc. So we again have an infinite number of planes of section that will give us precisely the measurement we are looking for. Again, the measurement endpoints are very good. We are measuring from bone to bone. Bone is very bright, and it represents an excellent endpoint of measurement. So in fact, there are very few pitfalls in the measurement of the biparietal diameter. By contrast, the head circumference is a relatively difficult measurement. Why? because it must be correct in three dimensions. Two of the dimensions are the same as the biparietal diameter, so you have to reach the appropriate level of the skull. Secondly, you cannot incline the beam through the skull. But thirdly, in the case of the head circumference, the plane of section must be exactly parallel to Reed's baseline, which means that, in effect, there is only one plane that is exactly perfect for measuring the head circumference. Now, in fact, obviously, there probably are a number of planes, you know, close to that plane where the 
difference in measurement would be too small to compute. But I think you get the idea. By comparison to the bipyridal diameter, where we have a great deal more latitude for getting the correct measurement, with the head circumference, we have a great deal less latitude. Nonetheless, the endpoints of measurement are good. Again, we're measuring bone to bone, excellent measurement endpoints. So again, the pitfalls are reasonably few. What you want to see to know you're getting the measurement at the right level is the third ventricle flanked by the thalamic nuclei. That tells you you're at the correct level. How do you know that the beam is not inappropriately in an angle of inclined to the perpendicular? And you do that by looking at the calvaria. You want the calvaria to be perfectly symmetrical. The abdominal circumference uh, is our final measurement, and it is the key to accurate weight prediction. And once we pass 24 weeks, hopefully we are not trying to judge the age of a fetus, because if we are, we're in trouble. So unfortunately, the abdominal circumference turns out to be our most difficult measurement. Again, it has to be correct in three dimensions. We have to get the right level of the abdomen. We cannot incline the plane of section, and we cannot angle the plane of section to the perpendicular midline. So all three of those must be correct, which again means we have essentially a single plane of section that is absolutely perfect for measuring the abdominal circumference. Very similar to the head circumference, as we discussed a while ago. But the difference here is that the endpoints of measurement of the head circumference are excellent. You're measuring to the edge of the calvaria. The calvaria is bone. Very easy to see that edge. But the endpoints of measurement of the abdominal circumference is the skin. And the skin can be up against the placenta. It can be up against the myometrial wall, the fetal um, femur may indent, not the fetal femur, I'm sorry, the fetal thigh may indent the abdominal wall. The abdominal wall can have contour irregularities, and therefore there are many pitfalls in the measurement of the abdominal circumference. In the case of the abdominal circumference, we are interested in the fetal umbilical and portal venous anatomy. Look, as I've already said, we want to measure the liver. That is our intent. We're not trying to get the belt size of the fetus. We're trying to get its liver size. And if we're interested in the liver size, then the correct plane of section is one that is taken through the junction of the right and left portal veins. Why? Because the right and left portal veins define the portal plane of the liver, which is the dead center of the liver. Now, even today, you will see textbooks that tell you to line up along the umbilical segment of the left portal vein. Sometimes they just call it the umbilical vein. That's incorrect. And certainly, you do not want to measure low enough that you only see the umbilical vein. So you do not want to get measurement C because that inclines the plane of section. Why? Because the umbilical segment of the left portal vein in almost all fetuses is inclined toward the umbilicus. So if you line up along the umbilical segment of the uh, left portal vein, you can see that it creates an elliptical margin. Now, the other thing that you want to know that you uh, this tells you you're at the right level. The symmetry of the ribs tells you that you have not inclined the plane of section. If you incline the plane of section, you will either see a rib and no rib, or you will see a rib and multiple ribs. So you'll see like three segments of ribs on this side. So you want to make the ribs symmetrical at the junction of the right and left portal vein. Typically in that picture, you will also see the stomach. But I'm not looking for the stomach. I'm looking for the junction of the right and left. Rules of measurement. 
Your job is to choose the plane of section and judge the endpoints of measurement. If you have the correct plane of section, then simple observation of the endpoints will tell you not only the degree of error, but the direction of the error. This is all you need to make a rational judgment as to whether the fetus is normal or abnormal, as to whether or not the measurement needs to be repeated or not. And this I cannot overstress. Avoid the temptation to make the measurement fit the menstrual age. It is a great temptation, but one that must be avoided at all costs.